Can I make a confession to you today? I am not a rule breaker. I'm not. I never have been. Always my tendency has been to follow the rules. I will not go in a door that is marked exit. I will not go in an express checkout line if I have more than 15 items, and I will count. Um, if I show up late somewhere, it will haunt me forever, and I will be 20 minutes early the next time. I'm not a rule breaker. And I share that with you today because my wife, Judy, is. <laughs> and it drives her crazy. <laughs> Ever since I met her, there's been this like hidden rebel inside of her. And whenever there's a rule to follow or, uh, or something that she's supposed to do, this, this rebel just kind of comes out of nowhere, and it compels her to do the exact opposite of whatever she's been told to do. A while back when we were in college, we had just started dating, and the school that we were at, there was a tornado warning. And it wasn't just like a tornado warning in the county, like the tornado was coming, and it was coming straight for us, and it was big. Now, I'm from the Midwest. I've been through my share of tornado warnings, and I know many of you have as well. But this one was, it was actually like pretty scary. Like the, the sky was greenish and tree branches were falling and you know, car alarms are going off. Like it was legit, it was a, a very real tornado. And so our entire campus was put on lockdown. We were told to go inside and stay inside. Now I was about a block off campus at the time at a friend's house and while I was there, I get a call from Judy. And she tells me that she's not going to go inside and stay inside like the rule was, but that she wanted to come over to where I was so we could go through this tornado together. Because apparently that's what couples do. <laughs> that was new to me. And so I, I, I told her and we were talking and, and having the best interests at heart, I think this is where I messed up. Because like I said, we had just started dating. I didn't know much about girls. I still don't, um, but, but I, I, I am a rule follower, remember? And so with her best interest at heart, trying to keep her safe, I told her that she should not come to me and that she needs to stay where she was. But maybe I didn't say it like that. Maybe I worded it a little bit stronger. Maybe I used a word that I shouldn't have, and maybe that word was forbid. As in, I forbid you to leave where you are. And that was a mistake. It was one of those things where like, as soon as you say it, you're like, oh no, what did I say? And, I, and literally, while we're on the phone, I hear this like, gasp of anger, and I hear a door slam, and I hear her running to her car while we're still on the phone having an argument about how it is the 21st century and no man will tell her what to do. And I, at the same time she's telling me this, I'm telling her to go inside and stay inside. And it, the tornado was coming and it was this crazy time. And somehow, I guess by God's grace or something, she made it safely and we've all made it through okay. And even though we were both perfectly safe, that was the longest tornado warning of my life. <laughs> what is your relationship to obedience? We've been doing this series, Disciplines of Grace, and today, the discipline that we are talking about is obedience, and not obedience to tornado policies, and not obedience to dumb things your boyfriend tells you, but obedience to God, doing what he says. Isn't that a fun one? <laughs> now, I'm sure that in this room, we have rule followers and we have rebels, we have areas in our life where obedience comes naturally, and maybe some where it doesn't. And yet when it comes to spiritual obedience, doing what God says, I think we can all agree that this one can be a challenge. It can be difficult. It can be really hard to do what we see that God tells us to do. And yet our goal today is to see how in our relationship with God, this grace that we, that we desire, this grace that we've been talking about for this whole series, Disciplines of Grace, how that grace only comes at the speed of our obedience. The grace we desire comes at the speed of our obedience. And so today I want to read with you a passage from the book of James chapter 1. And James wrote this book as a letter to the church that had been scattered because of persecution. And the passage that we're going to read today is kind of like his introduction summary to this entire book. This is the thing that is at the core of his message. This is what is most important in his mind to teach this church. 
And so we're going to read this together. It'll be on the screen. But let me read for you James 1, starting at verse 19. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Verse 22, listen to this. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror, and after looking at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts is pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows and their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. So we see here in this passage a choice that we all have to make, a choice with two different options and how those options can lead to two different outcomes. And so the first option, the first choice that I want to show to you and talk with you about today is the problem of incomplete faith the problem of incomplete faith. I'm not a big fan of going shopping, but there is one store that I love going to, and that store is Ikea. Maybe some of you have been to Ikea before. Any store that sells meatballs is fine in my book, all right? So that's just a rule I live by. And in fact, we've gone to Ikea enough that we've learned that when you go there, you have to be careful. You have to have a plan when you go to Ikea, because if you're not, we'll end up with like a dining room set, and we don't even have a dining room, okay? So you have to be careful. We go there on purpose and for a purpose when we go to Ikea. And as much as I love shopping at that store, that is how much I hate assembling their furniture. It is the bane of my existence. A few years ago, I went to Ikea and I bought a desk for my office at the time. And um, you know how we just read that we need to be slow to anger, right? Well, I think God knew that I needed a test in that and maybe I needed to work in that. So I think we have a picture. This is how my desk from Ikea came out of the box. Completely unassembled, just like all of their stuff. And I'm convinced of something here today, and it's that the people that write the instructions for IKEA furniture are secretly playing a prank on all of us. Like they come together and they meet and they say, okay, like how can we make this really vague and unhelpful? What What if we don't put any words and just have pictures, and the pictures are like six different pieces with arrows going in four different directions, and they'll figure it out. And maybe instead of using um, a real tool, we'll just give them a little Allen wrench that'll make it go three times as long. And so I was working on this, and I was getting frustrated, to say the least. I was working on this desk for hours, and I was getting so upset, I almost quit a bunch of different times, but I persevered, and finally, we got the finished product that is a beautiful desk. If you have any carpentry needs, please call me after the service. We'll work something out. But I was working on this, and I was so proud of myself, you guys. Like, I think I was just like texting all my friends, like, I built a desk. And then I noticed something after I was done. There was one problem. <laughs> I, I forgot a few pieces, apparently. And I Googled really quickly, does IKEA give you extra screws? And the results were not favorable for me. <laughs> and you know what I did? I, didn't, I just threw them away. I didn't even care. They went straight to the trash. Now, we've moved since then. I don't know if that desk is still standing. My guess is someone put like a folder or like a feather or something really light on it, and it just collapsed. But that's not my problem. You see, when I came, when I, when I came to Ikea and I got this desk and it came out of the box, I had everything that was necessary. I had all the pieces. I had the instructions, kind of, and I had the tool that I needed. And yet it was incomplete. It was incomplete. There was still work to be done. 
Now, hold on to that. Let me read for you three verses in James 1. Verse 19 again. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. I want to make an assumption about you here today. I want to make an assumption um, because I know that even in this room that we have people with a long history of faith. We have people that are figuring their faith out as they go, even now. And maybe we even have people that we come here and we just don't even know if this is true for us. We have questions and, you know, some of the stuff that we teach just doesn't make sense. And I just want to say, as an aside, whatever your situation is, whatever state of faith that you're in, we're so glad that you're here. But my guess is that if you are in this room today, that there has been or currently is a part of you that has asked this question. If God is real, what does that mean for my life? If God is real, what does that mean for my life? This is at the core of so much of what James is teaching in this letter. And I think there are some parallels to what we live and what we see today. You see, he writes that we need to put away this wrong behavior. We need to put away immorality and instead receive the word. To hear the word that is taught and to to read this book and to soak up its wisdom. And that's good and that's true. And yet I think there are some of us and there are times in our lives when we can get this confused. We're tempted to believe something that maybe isn't completely true because we are tempted to think that the person that we are supposed to be, the person that God has called us to be, the answer to our problems is in knowledge only. It's in knowing more facts. It's in memorizing more things and that alone. We're tempted to think that is enough. And yet James doesn't stop there. He doesn't end with knowledge. It's good to gain knowledge, but he continues to the very heart of this passage. Verse 22 again says this, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Don't just show up. Don't just listen, don't just hear, don't just agree. Do what it says. He says that those that have knowledge without action have incomplete faith. That knowledge is wasted. In the same way that having all the pieces didn't assemble my desk. In the same way that knowing the recipe doesn't fill your stomach. In the same way that reading the manual doesn't fix your car. If we are to be the people that God has called us to be, we must not just hear the word. We have to do what it says. A few months ago, I was watching a show called Shark Tank. Maybe you've seen the show, but if you haven't, it's a show where business owners will come on and look for an investment into their company from these business Sharks, And we were watching, and there was a company that came on, and this company sold mirrors that make you look skinnier than you are. (laughs) I know. And they had done all this research, and they had some mirror technology. I don't know how it works. But literally, they had done this research and shown that people that have these mirrors had higher self-esteem, and that companies that sold them in their stores would sell more clothes and more products because you look better. And now, as I read James talk about looking at yourself in a mirror and forgetting what you look like, I think of that company every time, of a company whose entire success is built around self-deception, around telling yourself something that isn't true. Because I think for so many of us, not just physically, but in our spiritual relationship with God, we do the same exact thing. We tell ourselves a picture of ourselves that isn't maybe true. But imagine looking at yourself in a mirror today. Maybe you did it as you were getting ready to go, and imagine looking at yourself and noticing that something's off. Like maybe your hair is out of place, or you've got a piece of food in your teeth, or you know, something is off. 
And imagine thinking that just because you are aware of it, that will fix the problem. You would be lying to yourself, and people would talk about you behind your back or say it to your face. I don't know, one or the other. But the reason, one of the reasons that we come here and that we discuss God's word and we dive into it is to see a true reflection of ourselves, to see ourselves as God sees us, not as we see us, not as the world sees us, but to see ourselves in the truth of God, to see how much he loves us, how much he was willing to do for us, and how that love is not ready to just leave us where we are, but he wants to transform us. It is when we dive into God's word that we see where disobedience is living, and it's not enough to just be aware of it. It's incomplete. About this time, a year ago, I started to deal with something that I had never dealt with before. I started to struggle with things like anxiety and anger. And there were a lot of reasons for that, but it quickly got to the point where it was starting to affect my everyday life. It was affecting my work, it was affecting my relationships, my friendships, just everything, and it came very quickly. And there was a time in my life where I became aware of these issues. I was aware that I had anxiety in my life. And yet for many reasons, probably pride being the biggest one, there was a time where I knew it, and yet I didn't act on it. There was this gap that started to form between knowledge and obedience, knowledge and action. And I had people in my life that had been telling me the same thing, people that I trusted, that I believe God has given to me to speak truth into my life. And they were all saying the same thing. They were telling me I needed to get help. They were telling me that this is a problem that I couldn't deal with on my own. <coughs> and yet there was a time where I just didn't act. Because in my head, it wasn't that bad. <clears throat> in my head, it wasn't anything that I couldn't deal with on my own. And I'll tell you what changed it. I'll tell you what changed that in my life is that Judy sat down with me and she had a conversation. And she told me how these issues that I had been dealing with, this anxiety that had turned to anger, that had affected our relationship, had hurt her that it had caused this division in our relationship that I wasn't even aware of. And let me tell you something, that is not a conversation you want to have. It was hard to hear that, and yet I knew that that was going to change something for me. I knew that that was going to change something because I had this knowledge, and yet it was time for obedience. It was time to listen to the people that God had put into my life. It was time to apologize to those I had hurt. And it was time to get myself to a Christian counselor, someone who was trained to deal with these things that I couldn't figure out on my own. <coughs> you see, just like was, what was going on in my life, this is the problem of incomplete faith. The problem of incomplete faith is not that it just affects us. We all know that our choices affect our actions, but what changed for me was when I realized that my choices and my lack of obedience was causing a brokenness in my relationships. It was causing a brokenness with the people that I cared about the most. It is hard to grow when we are living in this gap between knowledge and obedience. We can know all the right answers. We can know everything there is to know, and yet without action, it will always be incomplete. If we are to be the people that God has called us to be, if we are to be transformed in his image, we have to realize that transformation does not simply come from information. It comes from application. It comes from pursuing obedience. James moves on, and he shows us uh, door number two. He shows us the contrast to this problem of incomplete faith. And in these last few verses, he's going to show us the blessing of obedient faith. The blessing of obedient faith. Something that is at the kind of core of this whole message is the relationship between faith and works. And maybe you've been taught this before and, and heard it before, but as a church, we teach that salvation comes from faith alone. There's no way to earn our salvation. You know, we can't be good enough. We can't do enough. It is a gift from God. And yet James very clearly relates the two. 
In fact, later in his letter, he'll write that faith without action is dead. And so maybe a better way to view it is this. Maybe a, or a better way to, to say it would be that we do not earn our salvation through our actions, we reveal them. Our actions reveal our salvation. And so in these verses, we're going to see three things that happen when we live a life of, of, of obedience, three blessings that are given to us. Verse 25, whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do, who do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. First, when we live a life of obedience, our calling is revealed. Our calling is revealed. A few years ago, I met a guy who was in his senior year of high school. And if you remember your senior year of high school or you're going to be living it, you might remember the pretty big life choices that you make during that time. And he had a big one to make. You see, this guy had a plan for his life. He had it all figured out. He, his plan was to go to college. He was going to study business. He was going to enter the corporate world. And he was going to make a ton of money. That was his plan. He had it all figured out. And the problem with that plan was that for months, he had started to get this sense. He had started to maybe think about if God was calling him to something else, if God maybe had a different plan for him. He started to get this sense that maybe he was being called to ministry, to be a pastor. And we talked about this, and, and he wrestled with it for, for months, and he kept going back and forth. He couldn't decide, you know, what he was being called to, what the right decision was for him. And the thing that changed in his life, the thing that helped him figure it out, was when he started to get into God's Word, and he started to realize just how important serving others can be. Just how important serving others was. So he started serving in his local church, and he started teaching kids the Bible. That was the way he wanted to serve. He started teaching kids the Bible, and in doing that, he realized that he had a passion he had never known before. And he fell in love with teaching the Bible. And just like that, everything clicked for him. And since that time, since that experience in his life, his entire plan has changed. He still went to college, but now he's studying ministry. He wants to be a youth pastor when he graduates. <laughs> And he's serving, and he's making an impact. And I truly believe that there will be people in the world who come to know Christ because of his obedience. You see, when we live in obedient faith, our calling is revealed. Verse 25 talks about the law that gives freedom. But freedom only comes when we are willing to put our plans second and first obey what God has in front of us. For a few of us, that may mean going into ministry, but all of us are here on purpose and for a purpose. And it is only through steps of obedience that we discover and rediscover what that purpose is in every season of our life. It's so easy to view obedience as a prison, as something that we can or cannot do, and, a, and rules that we have to follow, and the rebels amongst us don't want to do that. But what if instead of a prison, what if obedience is a pathway to freedom? They talk about this in, in Psalm 119. Let me just read a few verses for you. It writes, he writes, Never take your word of truth from my mouth, for I have put my hope in your laws. I will always obey your law forever and ever. I will walk about in freedom, for I have sought out your commands. Hope and freedom come from obedience. Sometimes obedient faith will take you somewhere that you never wanted to be. It will have you do something that you never wanted to do, and yet maybe in those places is the exact place where God's grace and his freedom and his purpose is waiting for you. Second, when we live in obedient faith, our conversations change. Our conversations change. Is that as that young man was, was changing his life plans and figuring everything out, I got to know one of his friends as well. 
And I asked him, you know, how he was doing and how his life was, and he shared with me that he was in a period of just really good spiritual growth. He was getting into his word a lot, and he was just growing so much, and and he was excited about it. And one of the things that he told me was that in that growth and in that learning and in that knowledge, he felt called from God to, to start changing the way he treated his family. You see, he was in high school at the time, and he had a younger sister who was just entering high school as well. And they were like many siblings. They would fight a lot. They would use words to to put each other down and to be mean to each other. And yet he decided that God wanted him to do something else, that it was time for a change. You see, he had noticed that his sister had started to change a little bit as she was entering this new phase of life. She had started to maybe lose some of her confidence, to deal with things like insecurity, to struggle in ways that she had never struggled before. And he made a commitment to me that day. And his commitment was this. I want to use my words to be an encouragement to her, to lift her up instead of putting her down. And I watched as that commitment was lived out in his life and how he was by no means perfect. And yet how every day he got just a little bit better at it. And how his words, how the way that he treated her changed their relationship. And that relationship became a lifeline in this girl's life who was going through a difficult time. When we live in obedient faith, our conversations change. When we realize that we can't love God and hate our sister at the same time. Verse 26 talks about this idea. It talks about those who consider themselves religious, and yet who do not keep a tight rein on their tongues and how they deceive themselves. I know for me, words can be hard to control. I know sometimes they just like, they just come out of nowhere. And like when you tell someone that they're forbidden to leave their dorm or, or things like that. And, and sometimes they, they just seem impossible to control. And yet this verse can give us hope of something different. It can give us hope that our words can be used to encourage and not put people down. That we can be honest with each other. That we can give people hope through the words that we choose. Because if we are a Christ follower, our words have weight. Our words represent what we believe. And our conversations have to change. Of course, we won't be perfect. That's why we're thankful for God's grace. And yet it is available in the hope that we would use it to change our obedience. Third, when we live a life of obedience, our community benefits. Our community benefits. During the same time that I was getting to know these guys, we got to know a a girl in the same friend group as well. And she had a very different life story. She had been through a lot in her young life. She had experienced pain and brokenness like not many people do. And yet it was through the love of a church that in a matter of months of getting to know her, she went from lost and broken to saved and redeemed. And that changed everything for her. She became on fire for God and she was reading her Bible and coming to church and she signed up for a mission trip and she didn't even know what a mission trip was. She just knew that she wanted to do whatever God put in front of her. But then she realized something, that she realized that salvation was not just for her. And she started to invite her dad to come to church with her. And her dad was not a church person. He was not a person who felt welcome at a church and he had his own issues that he was working out. And yet because of that invitation from his daughter, because of her invite, he showed up. And as he showed up, God started to show up too. God started to heal his brokenness and work on his issues. And in a matter of weeks of showing up for the first time, he came to know Christ as well. And they got baptized together. And there was this incredible image that I'll never forget of a family that has been transformed because of God's grace, but also because this girl realized that what he sees as pure religion is this, when we look out for our neighbor when we look out for others, when we try to benefit our community. We talked earlier about how incomplete faith has these ripple effects that we will never be able to predict. And yet the opposite is true as well. When we live in obedient faith, our community benefits. Verse 27 talks about religion that God views as pure. 
to look after orphans and widows. See, orphans and widows were considered the lowest in society and the farthest from God. And maybe for us, the truth here today is this. Maybe it is our step of obedience that can be the difference, that can be the breakthrough for the person we consider farthest from God. Maybe our obedience can be someone's breakthrough who we consider to be far from God. We do not obey to be saved, but when we obey, we show just how much God has changed our lives. What if it's a simple thing for you? What if it's a simple thing like signing up for neighborhood serve? What if it's something that easy that could be the catalyst for someone who who would simply see that there is a church out there that loves them, that there is a church that is there for them, and maybe that could be their breakthrough. That could be the thing that could be their catalyst. Those are the stakes that we are playing for when we do things like neighborhood serve. It's good to be nice, and it's good to do good deeds, and yet we play for eternal stakes. Each week this series, we've been ending our time together with a challenge, and there have been a lot of them covering everything from gratitude to generosity to forgiveness. And then we have a slide actually for you today to, to show kind of just a brief recap of each week's challenge. And to close today, I want to do this. I want you to look at this list and maybe reflect on one of these challenges, one of these topics that is difficult for you to show obedience. Maybe it's gratitude. Maybe writing down what you are thankful for does not come naturally. Maybe it's generosity and, and giving and, and being a person who is generous is really a challenge for you. Maybe setting a date to eat in community sounds like a nightmare for you. But maybe confession and forgiveness is something that, man, it's good and you know that it's true. And yet maybe there is this gap between knowledge and obedience in your life. And my guess is for each of us, even if we've missed different weeks and we haven't been here, looking at one of these topics, there's at least one that pops out to us as one that can be difficult to obey. We know that it's true, and yet maybe we thought we escaped it by skipping that week or not living that challenge out, but we're bringing it back into your life. Because your challenge this week is to pick one of these topics, one where obedience did not come naturally to you, and to recognize and to believe that in God's economy, there is grace that comes when knowledge and obedience meet. There's grace that comes when knowledge and obedience meet, and our blessings come at the speed of our obedience. We want you to take this challenge. We want you to to simply try it and see how God will show you grace in a new way this week. We encourage you to live that out today and just to see what will happen. Let me pray for you. God, we are thankful for your grace today. We are thankful for your word. And yet, God, in that thankfulness, we don't just recognize that it is true. We recognize that you have called us to something here, that you have called us to be new creations, that you have called us to obey what you have said. And so, Father, right now, I ask that you would give us that grace, give us that courage, give us that boldness to choose whatever topic it is in our life that can be a challenge to obey, whatever area that we have been holding on to, and to recognize that your grace comes where that knowledge and obedience meet. We're thankful for who you are, and we pray all this in your name. Amen.